Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is, wherever you are tuning in. Thank you so much for joining me today for this next edition of Facebook Live. <laughs> and I say next because, gosh, I've been doing Facebook Live sessions now since uh, March, March 2020, right? The very beginning of COVID lockdowns as a way of um, offering something that I thought might be supportive to my friends, my family, my community uh, in that uh, very, very challenging time. So, um, yeah, I hope that was helpful. But that essentially led to this. <laughs> so um, here I am. So a little bit of a frame then of today's offering. I'm doing a talk today on the topic of self-compassion. And if you've been following me and the Facebook Live sessions that I do, you're probably well aware that I tend to plan a few weeks or a month of weekly Facebook Live sessions as a run-up to an online meditation program that I'm doing. And this is no different in that way. Uh, I am offering a online what I'm calling an online immersive meditation experience. Uh, it's a 12 week program. It launches on July 2nd and it runs to September 17th. So I wanna speak a little bit more about this. The, the title of the course is Self-Compassion, Forgiveness and the Inner Critic. Self-Compassion, Forgiveness and the Inner Critic. There are two sections uh, that's done really to help um, make the course available to people from different time zones, different parts of the world. So section one is running from 7 a.m. to 9.30 a.m. East Coast Standard Time on Sunday mornings. Section two, 7 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. East Coast Standard Time on Sunday evenings. <clears throat> And again, the course runs July 2nd to September 17th. Now, if you've been engaging in some of the course offerings that I've been offering in the past, uh, you might know, well, this is a little bit different. Uh, yeah, that's true. In the past, what I've generally done is done eight-week programs meeting twice a week. But that started to feel really quite uh, cumbersome. There was a lot of material being offered in a very short amount of time, which is fine. But I thought maybe a little bit more spaciousness might be helpful for the participants and for myself. So meeting once a week for 12 weeks, we still cover more or less the same amount of material. But there's more time in between the sessions for which we can use to engage in the meditations, the informal practices, and how we might bring these practices to our day-to-day -day experience. So that's the reason for the different framework. Now, all of that being said, I really do encourage the participants of the retreats to meet uh, once a week at a separate time, outside of the frame of the course maybe three or four people in a study pod, for example, and then uh, to engage in some of the questions you might have, share some of your experiences with each other, really um, support each other and inspire each other to move through the course. That can be very, very, very helpful. A few more things uh, around the course and then I wanna get into today's topic. Um, so the meetings are offered over Zoom and each session is recorded and made available only to the retreat participants. <clears throat> and we do this because, you know, to ask people to meet every day for 12 weeks at the same time, uh, that can be quite challenging. I know we all have busy lives and busy schedules and things like that. So I have made... Uh, made it accessible for people to miss a few sessions or more than a few sessions. You could actually miss all of the sessions live and do the whole thing in your own pace, your own time. You're also welcome to do that, but you won't then receive the benefit of the community. Uh, and so during the live sessions, I tend to offer some breakout rooms, 
a lot of Q&A discussion time and things like that. So that's the benefit of doing the live program. I also want to mention here that I'm also there live on the calls every week. So none of the content of the course is pre-recorded. All of the content is there live, uh, interactive with all of the participants and myself. And everything is offered within a trauma-informed framework and in a secular, non-sectarian voice. My training uh, is in the Buddhist traditions, um, but I speak and teach in a way that, uh, well, I'm very passionate about making these teachings accessible to people from all beliefs, all walks of life, any background. Doesn't matter what religion or no religion, all welcome, all welcome. Ah, so let's talk a little bit about compassion. So, the word compassion in Latin, compati, means to suffer with, to suffer with. And so when we are offering compassion to another, essentially what's being meant there is that that other person's heartbreak becomes our own heartbreak. We see somebody struggling, and that person's struggle becomes our struggle. And so this is, is the empathic resonance, that empathic uh, aspect of compassion. And when we are in the company of another person while they're struggling, while they're suffering, our heart trembles in a way. Right? We feel this, this quivering of the heart to that same frequency. And that, that trembling of the heart is the heart trembling in compassion. So <clears throat> compassion in and of itself is that movement forward to alleviate the struggling. Now that movement's forward that says, how can I help? How can I help? That's compassion. And so here we, we can start to kind of sense the, the distinguishing characteristics between empathy and compassion. These two often get conflated, and I, I feel that's a, a grave mistake. <laughs> That empathy is the ability to feel into uh, what someone else is feeling. And compassion is the move forward to help. And so true compassion has this blend of empathy and this movement forward to help, this compassionate move. And so in that way, Really, true compassion changes the way we interact uh, with our life, with the world, and how we relate to ourselves. So compassion, this movement forward, how can I help? How can I help? And so you might think of a time when you may have been with a close friend who was struggling, suffering. Perhaps they had maybe just lost a job or um, lost a friend or a family member or encountered a divorce. Maybe they're struggling with um, other things like homework or uh, relationship issues or um, getting to bed on time. <laughs> so when we perhaps visualize, imagine a moment in the future when we're with a friend who's encountering these various forms of struggle, we might imagine what words might we offer to that person? What might we say to somebody who's, you know, having communication challenges with their best friend, for example? What might we offer as support 
to someone who just lost their job, and just lost a family member. And just exploring this on your own for a few moments, you know, maybe putting a hand over your heart. What would I say to that person? And now replace the image of that person with yourself. How might you support yourself in times of struggle? Or what words might you offer to yourself when there's pain? You know, my go-to is putting a hand on the heart. Oof. Wow, yeah, that's, this is really challenging right now. And it's really great how you're showing up and really doing a great job. It's amazing. Right? So that's that's self-compassion. Right? In a sense, it doesn't have to be out loud. I was just <laughs> modeling it. Um, but it could be out loud if that's helpful for you. So self-compassion requires the capacity to be present with our own discomfort present with our own pain so that we can then hold that discomfort, hold that pain gently, lightly, in awareness, and then offer ourselves or others a wise and, and perhaps a kind-hearted response to that pain, to that discomfort, to that challenge. So, and that response could be verbal, could be words of support, or it could be perhaps just one or two words, or it could be silence. It could just be holding space, holding that compassionate space for another. That can be so nourishing. And sometimes that's exactly what's needed. It's just that human company, that companionship into that challenging situation. So compassion can be quite challenging, right? <clears throat> compassion, whether it's compassion for ourselves or for others, compassion asks us to acknowledge the pain and the suffering and the struggle that's present. It, compassion asks us to hold that pain in our awareness, that discomfort gently in our awareness. And then in that space, we can move forward with that move of compassion. So it's in a sense bittersweet because initially we're holding that pain, that discomfort, that's, that can be challenging, but then that movement forward feels good. There's a feeling of being connected to ourself or to others. There's a feeling of, of um, reward because we're offering kindness to ourself or to others. And on that note, just to mention here that when human beings are in a state of compassion, the reward centers of the brain and of the nervous system tend to light up. So compassion does have this nourishing, healing, um, good feeling quality to it. So I want to talk a little bit about a uh, particular practice here. And I just kind of uh, modeled a little bit of that um, when I was offering that introduction here. But I want to talk about a practice that's known as the three pillars of self-compassion pillars of self-compassion. And this comes from the work of Dr. Kirsten Neff, who really codified what's known as mindfulness self-compassion. It's a beautiful practice. If you're not familiar with Kirsten Neff's work, I highly recommend checking her out. She's absolutely wonderful. So the three pillars of self-compassion are mindfulness, or what I call heartfelt awareness, 
kindness, and common humanity. So heartfelt awareness, kindness, common humanity. And I'll just very quickly unpack each of these as we go. So this quality of mindfulness, and I, just to speak a little bit about why I frame that as heartfelt awareness, um, the word that's being translated into mind or mindful, the Sanskrit word, the Pali word, also the Mandarin word, sati, that word could just as easily be translated into English as heart or heartful. And it's a much different quality, right? If I invite you to put your mind on the breath, We'll just do that for a moment. You know, put your mind on the breath. And now relax that. Just look around, perhaps. Now I'd like to invite you to put your heart on the breath. Put your heart on the breath. Yeah, and I think you might find that if you didn't already feel a difference there, if you spend some time with that, at least for me in, in my experience and my explorations, what I notice is that when I put my heart on the breath, it's kind of a softer, more warmth kind of quality to it. And there's no judgment. There's no, should I be breathing deep or shallow? Should I be, you know, holding my breath in a particular way? Should I be breathing in the nose and out of the mouth? None of that's there when we put our heart on the breath. It really facilitates this very, very fundamental quality of non-judgment. Non-judgment is whether you call it mindfulness or heartfelt awareness, non-judgment is an integral quality of that. So in the frame of mindful self-compassion or the three pillars of self-compassion, we bring heartfelt awareness to the any struggle, to the struggle of the present moment, any struggle that might be there. You know, it might be simply, um, you know, maybe uh, I'm hungry, right? So I'm struggling around uh, ignoring the hunger, the twangs of hunger pain in my stomach while I'm offering this talk, right? It's just an example. It's not really true. Let's just say that, <laughs> right? So there's, there's the, so I can be, I can bring heartfelt awareness to that. Okay, there's um, some discomfort, some pressure, some movement in the belly. Uh, there's also kind of a, a hangry mood, if you will, kind of irritableness there. There's kind of a, also the inner critic is, is showing up. Why didn't you eat earlier? Things like that, the inner the inner critic is active. Hmm. And so just observing with this heartfelt awareness, you know, what's arising? What what are the components? What are the composite materials of this quality of suffering that we're experiencing? And so we pause and we, we really take in exactly what's happening without judgment. Right? Feeling into the experience, the tactile, sensate experience. I say tactile, but it could be kinesthetic as well. Right? The tactile or kinesthetic experiences, the actual felt experience. And when we do this, this really allows us to respond to the struggle rather than to react. Right? This kind of disconnects the habitual reactive patterns. 
And so we just notice, oh yeah, there's hunger there, there's some pain, there's some grumbling, there's some irritability, whatever's there, right? And so this gives us the, the in a sense, the presence to look at the part or parts of life, the experiences that we may not like, that might be unpleasant, that might be in fact painful. But with this heartfelt awareness, we open and we bring this mindfulness. Now we can actually yeah, begin to look at those experiences, begin to examine them, perhaps uh, learn from them. So heartfelt awareness is really opening to our experience and the experiencer at the same time. Compassion is the experiencer component and the heartfelt awareness is the experience component. Maybe that's helpful. And we pause and accept. We pause and accept, okay, yes, this is the way it is right now. Right? And so if we don't give our compassion, mm, we don't give, rather, if we don't give ourself uh, this room, this spaciousness, this compassion, uh, then the, the pain, the struggle, the suffering tends to linger. So this is a real important aspect of acceptance around self-compassion. In fact, very often uh, you'll hear me use acceptance and self-compassion synonymously. And they're that connected. So, again, to refer to the Buddhist tradition here, um, the Buddha would often give an analogy using two arrows. He would say, you know, he would give, um, what's the word I'm looking for? A sutta, the sutta of two arrows. Sutta is a teaching, uh, and it has the same root to sutta, which means to bring together, to bring together. So. He would give this teaching called the teaching of the two arrows or the two darts. And he would draw the analogy of a soldier getting shot by an arrow. And that arrow is analogous to the pain that's inherent in the human experience. I think I spoke to this earlier, but uh, birth, sickness, aging, and death, and so forth. The, the pain, the suffering, the struggle, that's kind of sewn in to the package deal of having a human body and a human nervous system. <laughs> we all experience the, the pain of birth, sickness, aging, and death, and so forth. So that's inevitable. That first arrow, the soldier gets shot with that first arrow inevitably. Happens on a daily basis, sometimes multiple times a day, right? Now, the Buddha would then say that that soldier gets shot by a second arrow. And that second arrow is analogous to the argument with the first arrow. <clears throat> oh, I don't want to be feeling this. I don't want to be hungry right now. <laughs> Why didn't I eat earlier, right? That's the second arrow, right? You know, why am I going through this? Why is it so hard? Why is it so challenging? Why is it happening to me this way? All of this, the arguments with uh, the, the really wonderful insight teacher, Christina Feldman, she has this great phrase, the, the argument with the inarguable aspects of life. The argument with the inarguable aspects of life. And that second arrow is optional. <laughs> it's self-inflicted. Right? We don't need to do that. We don't need to be inflicting ourselves with this second arrow. And that is where all of our suffering lies. Right? The first arrow, we can't do anything about that. Life is just going to hurt sometimes. Right? But the second arrow, that's where we have some autonomy. And you might notice, okay, so the first arrow hits... If we're mindful of that, we can feel the pain of that, and then we can offer compassion to that pain, 
that move of compassion in that moment circumvents the second arrow. We avoid the second arrow. Beautiful, beautiful. So then we, uh, I'm just going to talk to the second pillar here, the pillar of common humanity. So as I mentioned just a few moments ago that, you know, this is a part of the human experience to experience pain or struggle or suffering, right? So we bring that aspect to the suffering of the present moment to this practice of self-compassion, right? You know, when, I don't know about you all, but for me, when I'm struggling or when I'm in pain, it really feels like, at least for a moment, that it's only me and that it's my predicament. It's my suffering. You know, for example, the other day I, I smashed my finger with a hammer. <laughs> it's like, ooh. You know, I, I went in and I was clenching my hand like this, right? And my body leans forward to kind of, in that, you know, very instinctive self protection measure, right? We're protecting our vital organs by doing that. And our whole way just goes, our whole energy, our look goes down. And for me, I think about, uh, I'm a Star Wars fan. <laughs> so I remember that scene in the, the, the first Star Wars, A New Hope, where Luke Skywalker is training, he's starting his training to be a Jedi, and he puts the helmet on and there's blinders on, and he can't see anything. You know, when, when I'm, you know, experiencing that first arrow, very often it feels like I have those blinders on. I can't see anything. I'm just in there with my own pain, my own discomfort. So this move of common humanity, we, we are kind of expanding back out. We get a more spacious, holistic, integral view. When we recognize that, Oh yeah, this is really challenging right now. And all 8 billion other people have been similarly challenged. Have been similarly challenged. Now that being said, I do want to acknowledge, you know, the very real fact that uh, pain is not evenly distributed throughout the world. That there is great amounts of suffering in some places of the world. And relative ease and um, uh, support in other places in the world. You know, the suffering that takes place in war-torn countries, in famine-ridden countries, in uh, plague-ridden countries, that suffering is really, really um, uh, uh, dramatic in a way, in a sense. It's very, very non-trivial, to say the least. And at the same time, you know, there are places in the world where uh, there there's a lot of um, support and infrastructure and uh, people are, are well-resourced and things like that. But even in those places, there's still struggle. There's still the, the suffering that is inherent in birth, inherent in sickness, inherent in aging, inherent in death, and so forth. But I, I do want to take some time here to to acknowledge that, you know, the suffering that occurs in marginalized communities, for example, the suffering that occurs through racism and discrimination, the suffering that occurs through um, homophobia and uh, discrimination around uh, gender orientation and so forth, you know, all of that type of suffering uh, is, is tremendous and, you know, really um, is warranting the call of compassion. It's one of the reasons why I teach. <laughs> so to come back to then our, our move of common humanity, that, that here in this practice we are uh, exploring the idea of softening our own discomfort and perhaps 
offering ourselves a way of holding our pain in that we can recognize that we're all in the same boat. You know, this is you know why support groups are so popular. Um, you know, we have the opportunity to come together uh, with people who have similar experiences and, you know, share the challenges and the insights that um, these experiences might bring. That can be so helpful, so supportive in our journey through challenge. So that's the role that common humanity plays in this three pillars of self-compassion model. And then I would like to just briefly speak to the role of kindness. And again, you know, I modeled this a little while ago, but that move of self-compassion, you know, just placing a hand over the heart or a hand on your shoulder, or perhaps both hands on the arms like that, giving yourself a hug. These are ways that we can physically support ourselves in, in compassion. So placing a hand on the heart, saying, well, let's use a different example. Maybe I'm having some emotional upset in my life, right? And so I've had a few days where I'm really grieving. And now maybe I'm just coming out of the grieving process, you know, or... Or maybe just starting, if it's just a few days, I may be just engaging in the grieving process. Right? And so I'll place a hand over my heart and say, Whew, wow, Chris, yeah, this is really tough. This is really tough right now. But it's amazing. You know, you're doing such a great job. Yeah. Really, really great how, how resilient you've become and how strong you are. You can really see how all of this practice is paying off. And per perhaps, you know, part of the move of kindness towards oneself uh, might be visualizing or imagining what your, your wisest self might say to you if they knew what you were experiencing right now. So it might be something like, Wow, that was amazing how you handled that. I would have never thought of that. Really, really great job. You know, something like that. And so we bring this move of kindness uh, to our experience. And this really speaks to um, something that we get into later in the course, um, working with the inner critic. Right? Because very often, uh, I don't know about you all, but for me, when I find that I'm in the midst of struggle or suffering, sometimes the inner critic can come up and say, uh, you should have known better. Why were you so stupid? How could you have done that? You know, what were you thinking? Right? And as long as we, you know, keep the inner critic there in play, <laughs> um, we tend to repeat those same patterns. Maybe you've already noticed this. <laughs> Why? Well, from at least from my perspective, nobody wants to listen to that harsh voice, right? Think of, if your best friend showed up and said, "Why are you so stupid? How could you do those things? <laughs> what were you thinking? You know, I'm gonna punch you in the face." Yeah, <laughs> sorry for that <laughs> trigger warning. Um, if our best friend showed up and said those things, we'd probably, you know, very quickly show them to the door, right? And it works the same way when we are berating ourselves. Yeah, I use that move of self-flagellation. When we're berating ourselves in that way, um, we don't listen to it, right? It doesn't really land in such a helpful way. But when we can turn and say, wow, Chris, man, that was, wow, you really got taken for a ride there. Really, really sorry about that. Really hurts. And, you know, maybe we can be a little bit wiser in the future. You know, how can we perhaps prevent this from happening? Right? 
So there we, we take the wisdom of the inner critic and we strip it from the, the, um, the, the harshness. We strip away the, the conde condemnation <laughs> that the inner critic is so uh, often enwrapped in. And so this way we can actually hear, okay, yeah, yeah, it would be really great if I could avoid situations like that in the future. How might I do that? So kindness is very important in this way. It helps us to sidestep that tendency of uh, the inner critic. And also it really helps us to recover and, re you know, get back on our feet, so to speak, after the... Um, the, the challenging, uh, perhaps painful situation has been uh, engaged with, that move of kindness can be really helpful way of um, restoring our resilience and strength. So I think that's all I would like to say there. Well, thank you so much for joining me. I'm sorry. We didn't get a chance to do any meditating today, but um, I have hundreds of guided meditations on my podcast page, which is Such Sweet Thunder Meditation Program. If you go to iTunes or to Spotify and you put that in, uh, you'll get about 440 guided meditations. <laughs> and by the way, if you find that overwhelming, uh, you can always email me or message me here through Messenger and ask me, you know, what, what meditations might you suggest uh, for me personally? And I could uh, send you a few links. So that being said, I'll also post a self-compassion uh, meditation with this video as well. So if you're curious about the three pillars of self-compassion, the guided meditation is right here. You're welcome to explore. So... I hope you all have a great morning, a great afternoon, a great evening. Thank you so much for being here live with me or watching us back on video. If you're interested in uh, some of the programs or registering for the retreat, please do visit my website, www.suchsweetthunder.org. Don't go to .com. That takes you to a Duke Ellington record. Great record, but .org is my website. <laughs> Okay, I'll ring the bell to close us out. Thank you so much.